Hi everyone, thanks so much for joining us. I will invite you to come closer if you, if you wish, uh, just so we can have a very intimate uh, conversation. Um, my name is In Wu and I am a faculty member in literature and I have the privilege of hosting and moderating today with our guest, Isabel Mueller. Um, I just have a quick, some quick comments and I will introduce our guest and then I have some opening questions, but again, this will be a conversation and she's very willing to take questions from the audience. So we'll have a very um, fluid discussion. So um, my privilege of introducing Isabel Mueller today comes from a number of things. So first of all, this is a, this book that I have in my hand and that you see on display. Um, is a very disturbing, but also remarkable and inspirational story. And I think that ambivalence captures very much, um, it's, this is a theme that's, that runs through the entire story. And it comes down even to the very last words of the, of the memoir, which I will roughly translate. I'm not gonna read the Vietnamese and subject you to my bad Vietnamese, but I will roughly translate it to uh, something that she says when she writes, even when you think you can take matters in your hands and determine for yourself what happens in your life, not everything is within your control. And I think there's two ways to look at that. So first, there is a very negative look, which is things are out of your control and you, you can feel powerless sometimes. But the way that it ends actually comes from a very positive look where she is encountering, um, I think you are back in Vietnam and uh, you're reconnecting with your mother via these close relationships that you're finding of her very serendipitously. So these happenstance encounters. And so that ambivalence captures both the positive and the negative sides to things happening within your control and without your control. Um, and I'm very excited about our guest today because she encapsulates some of the very thematics that I'm personally interested in in terms of my research and that I've written about. So for example, writing in a language that's not one's mother tongue. I'm sure that's a question you get a lot. And that is a question that a lot of our students are very interested in as well because Fulbright is an English speaking country. I mean, sorry, <laughs> speaking, <laughs> what is those mini country in its own, but it's an English speaking university but uh, all of our students are from Vietnam. And uh, I'm also really interested in the question of metissage and um, mixed races or mixed cultures within an individual, which you encapsulate. And so it was a very interesting experience for me actually to read this book translated in Vietnamese. So there's another layer of mediation there because it was written in German, but then translated in Vietnamese. And I have to say that it was, uh, it was interesting because there are some of these very difficult scenes to get through, but it was in Vietnamese. So it's a language that I myself am only re-familiarizing with now that I'm here back in Vietnam, even though it's a language that I grew up with, some of these terms and this vocabulary is not something that I'm familiar with. So getting exposure to that was was stark. Um, but at the same time, so it was both difficult and easy to read through because of that distance that I have with the Vietnamese. And um, so that's, that's something, when we talk about the language of expression, that's something that is never a straightforward choice. And that'll be a question that I'll ask as well as why you chose to write in uh, in German, particularly. And in this instance of life writing, I think um, Isabel Mueller also offers a double meaning to that term. So there's a genre of writing called life writing, which includes memoirs, autobiographies. And I think this particular uh, iteration of life writing that Isabel Mueller offers us gives us two meanings to that term. First is writing about the life of her mother, about herself, but also, so thinking about the past, writing that into a story, but also thinking about the future and bringing life to something that ha has already trans uh, transpired. 
So thinking both retroactively, but also in the in the future. So without further ado, I would like to introduce finally Isabel Mueller, who was born in Tours in France to a Vietnamese mother and a French father. And she grew up marginalized by her gender, by her socioeconomic status, by being mixed race. And she went on to live in Germany with her sister and eventually stayed there and worked as a translator. And so the book I have here is actually the second. Um, this one is called Daughter of a Phoenix. And it follows a work that pays homage to her mother, which is called From the Life of a Phoenix. And that, that first iteration talks about um, the trials and tribulations that her mother goes through in France, but also in Algeria. So both of these stories talk about this journey that these very phenomenal women go through, one of which is here uh, to share with us her experience. So you can just give me. <laughs> So thanks, Isabel, for joining us. I have a couple of opening questions, and then um, just kind of how the conversation flows, I'll add a few more, and then we'll also take some from the audience, if that's OK. So um, the first question is really about your writing process and how you came to writing. How did you decide that writing was going to be the thing that would help you potentially process or put forth your narrative, and also why did you write about your mother first and then about yourself because you know your experiences are usually most immediate and that's what you want to address first. So those are my two opening questions. Well, uh, I decided first uh, to write about my mother's story because it was uh, something that I had promised to her when I was a child. Uh, my mother used to tell me her whole life when I was a very small girl. And uh, when I was age six, uh, she was pretty finished with telling me all the stories uh, of her life in Vietnam and in Algeria. And uh, so I decided um, to write a book about her life because I thought that her story was so amazing that it needed to be shared with the world. And uh, I, it took me a long way to mm. write this story because uh, I had a few... Um, a few times where I started writing her book, her biography, when I was uh, age uh, 15 and 16. But then I, I saw that I was not mature enough. <laughs> so I had to, to let the manuscript and uh, start again when I, I was about uh, 30. Um, yeah, and I had to review it again with my mother when she was still alive. And uh, then because I was living in Germany at this time, uh, I left France when I was... Um, 20 years old, and I still live there in Germany with my German family. And uh, I decided to write this book uh, in German language because uh, it was a kind of challenge. Uh, it has something to do with my own past because when I was a child, uh, I lived in Germany one and a half year. And um, at that time, I could not speak German. <laughs> So I could only speak French, and in Germany they forced me to learn uh, English and to learn German, and uh, it was sometimes humiliating because I was not good. You know, I in France I used to be a very good student, and suddenly I was the last one, a very bad student in Germany, <laughs> and so uh, I felt a little bit ashamed, and I thought for myself one day. If I learn well the German language, maybe I will write my book in your language. So I will show you how good I am. And this is the reason why uh, it was a small revenge, you know, to, to, to be good in German. Because uh, later when I came back to France, uh, I had the opportunity to go to university. I received a high scholarship from the French government. And so I could study a few languages like uh, German and English and Russian. And so I, I got my diploma and was able to work as an interpreter and as a translator. And so I knew that I was good in that language. And uh, because it was a challenge, I love challenges. <laughs> and uh, I decided to write this book uh, in, in German first. And uh, in fact, I didn't plan to write my own biography. 
Uh, I had really no intention to do that because I thought that my life was quite normal. Uh, you know, not, not as uh, fascinating as the life of my mother. My main purpose was to, to make her life public because I, I still think that her life is so amazing and filled with experiences uh, and uh, wisdom uh, to, to help people to cope uh, with life when you are uh, living, experiencing uh, some struggle. And uh, when I found a German editor in uh, Germany, um, I drove there to sign the, the contract about the biography of my mom. But while we were speaking, they, they thought, wait a moment, your life seems to be interesting too. <laughs> uh, well, I, I, and I didn't tell them, you know, some subjects that were pretty sensitive. It was just my life story that seemed to be interesting. And, and because my mom had passed away at that time, uh, they said it might be better to publish your story first, and uh, then um, we will publish your mother's story later. So please go back home. <laughs> without contract and write your own story. So it took me uh, two more years. Uh, yeah, uh, it's pretty fast. In fact, uh, the publishers uh, were surprised that I could write this quickly because two years is, is a short time to write about um, uh, almost 300 pages, especially when you have small children at home, especially when you are, you are still working. So with a lot of discipline, uh, I could uh, every evening at 8.30 until 2 o'clock in the morning, I would sit down and, and hope to be able to write. And uh, I succeeded. And so this is the reason why they published first my biography. Yeah, I had no intention at all to share my, my experiences because it's first very private. And some subjects inside are not so nice. <laughs> but it is how life is. and. Um, in fact, I always say that my own biography is not only concerning uh, one sensitive uh, theme, it's concerning life, the way uh, uh, I came from, you know, the, the way I've been going uh, through my life. I've been experiencing many things like uh, discrimination or poverty, but I have also been experiencing uh, love and friendship and health, and I... I think I am a very positive person because I, I learn a lot out of the bad experiences because uh, I see the bad experiences as a lesson, a lesson of life, uh, which uh, forces me to think about things and to think about people. And I take the best out of it. And I never take the past with me when I live in the present. <laughs> I look... You know, I live really consciously each moment. Uh, I try to be as happy as can be and as open as possible to, to experience everything. Uh, yeah, and, and I look uh, to the future. So I, I'm, I try to be as happy as positive and to also to help other people that seem, um, they, they think that life sometimes when it's difficult, especially, uh, that they will not be able to to overcome the difficulties. But in fact, uh, I think everybody should try to overcome, in a way, the difficulty and not to repeat the same mistakes. Yeah, Because if you did not understand the reason why things happen to you, uh, I'm convinced that the, the experience will repeat itself again. It will take another shape, it will take another face, but the content of the experience will be the same until you understand what you should change and what you should do. And uh, when you have understood the lesson, you are getting stronger and you, go, you move on. And then you will be ready for the next, the next level. <laughs> so we are always uh, developing ourselves. And I think this is uh, what makes our life so interesting and beautiful. Thanks so much for that really thoughtful reflection. I find it really interesting that you say um, that you try to 
reflect and try to understand a situation that happens to you. But what if, what if that traumatic experience is something that is beyond your linguistic capacity to understand that? Is this, is this where this is where writing comes in? Is this how do you begin to process and understand something, or are you stuck until? You're stuck with trying to understand until you can move forward? Well, uh, it took me some time uh, to discover my own power, you know, uh, because especially when you have a traumatic experience when you are a child, uh, usually you focus uh, on the adults. You focus on uh, what your parents and uh, the adults around you are going to tell you. They are going to tell you who you are, what you have to think, how you have to behave, and you believe it because you are a child and you are not experienced. But bit by bit, when you're getting a little bit older, I mean, you have a brain, and the brain is here for something. It means that you should think by your own and uh, reflect uh, if the things that the, the adults are telling you are true or not. And so you, everybody should start asking questions. <laughs> Uh, even books, you know, uh, many people believe in books or believe in the stories that are written in books. But I keep saying, hey, do not forget that, that the writer of the book is a human being. And a human being is never perfect. A human being has mistakes. It's like science, you know. Many people think that science is true. So this is why I have a lot of discussions with a scientist mathematicians and pragmatic people that always uh, argue or they, you know, they want to explain everything with science. But it's not possible because we have much more than science. We have a combination of science and of uh, other, I would say, supernatural things that are around us. And this is a combination that gives us a good balance in life. And uh, hundreds of years ago, for example, the science thought that the Earth would be flat. <laughs> I mean, it was science. At that time, people really believed that it was flat. And bit by bit, they discovered that the Earth is round, more or less. <laughs> it's not a perfect circle, but anyway, uh, we are all progressing. And this is why we should, we should be open and keep our mind open to try to understand the things that happen in our lives. And uh, I think children are curious, and it is also very important to have the, some good people around you. I had the luck uh, to always uh, encounter kind people that gave me from time to time advice when I did not know where to go and what to decide and what to think. It was a big help. And uh, so I started by my own intuitively to develop some senses. And uh, I have learned one thing that uh, every one of us has a inside a kind of intuition, a kind of voice, and uh, that we have, we should follow this voice because this voice will never betray you. Uh, I think that's very empowering to hear because I think what you're fundamentally saying is whatever narratives that are told to you and also told about you, they're worth questioning. And unless that narrative comes from within or comes from your own voice and your own words, then what is the truth to to that? And I like that uh, you're you're also saying that even as a child, you have the power and the words to articulate your own story, other than those that are told to you. And I think that's that's kind of what I was trying to get at with the life writing. So not only reflecting about the events that happen in your life, the very concrete, evident things, but also channeling a certain life to those words, and uh, and manifesting a certain vision that you have of yourself into the world and bringing life to that. Um, I'm gonna ask a second question about your mixed race identity and uh, whether or not you, that ambivalence. So yes, there was discrimination when it comes to not being fully Vietnamese or being fully French, but if you felt that 
ambivalence also in navigating or channeling that mixed race identity to your advantage. Have you ever felt like you could have used one, one identity more than the other? And this is something that we see in other narratives of, um, of mixed race identities in our class for uh, film fiction, the making of modern Vietnams. We read a memoir by a woman named Kim Lefebvre called White Métis, and she writes precisely about how when she was living in Vietnam, her French identity is what stood out and what made her marginalized in the Vietnamese society. But in certain cases, she could also channel that French identity to be an object of desire or something that other people wanted and liked in her. So I wanted to ask about your experience being Métis. Yeah, I think all mixed children have the same kind of feelings. Uh, in fact, it was a problem for me when I was a pretty young child because I saw that for the French people, we were not, I was not accepted at all. Uh, they had some prejudice, but, and I didn't understand that, and I talked about that with my mother. And then she said something very uh, wise to me. She said, well, uh, in, your, in your body and mind, you, you carry two different cultures, the Vietnamese one, and the French one, so you should be in advantage. <laughs> and in fact, it is true. Uh, even um, uh, I think when I'm writing, for example, I'm writing in German, and the German language does not have as many words as the French language. Uh, so I use the French knowledge to make the style a little bit more bloomy and more, um, more uh, complete. And so it is something that you can recognize when you read, for example, the German version. You will discover uh, a different style. Yeah, that is special. It is special. You can recognize my style when you read it, when you read the original version. I think the translator um, has done a good job in trying to translate everything in Vietnamese language. But um, I think being mixed is a very good advantage, but I, I do not want to, uh, to limit my identity with uh, only two cultures. Of course, I am proud to, be, to have Vietnamese blood, and of course, I am proud to have French blood, but uh, most uh, of all, I am very proud to be a human being here on Earth, because the Earth uh, has no limit. It is the place where we live. We live on, so we are free to move, and we are free uh, to think, and so it's it's uh, what makes life uh, the most interesting. Do not limit yourself on one identity, but be proud of the identities you you carry in yourself. And in terms of limiting, so now that you have written this book, um, do you think that that is? that encapsulates your life? Would there be, I guess, revisions or were there things that you would have liked to change or do you feel like you can continue to rewrite and write yourself as you go along? Well, it depends on the readership. I mean, if the readership wants to, to know more about me and my life, well, I'm pretty young, so I still have time to write about the next 20 years. <laughs> but, uh, you know, it's, uh, as I said, my intention was not to write my own story. Uh, my in, in fact, I, I have uh, two passions in my life. The first one is to do something good, you know, uh, with uh, creating the foundation, for example, and, and support uh, poor children they have, that have no access to education. And the second big passion that I have since I am a child is writing. It means that I want to continue my career as a writer, and uh, that's uh, what I am able to do now because my both children are now living independently. Uh, my work is done, my husband is retired, and now I have time, so I'm, I'm able to do the things I love, and uh, my big love is writing. So I, I will for sure publish uh, next books, maybe different books, not only biographies, um, and uh, I hope that the Vietnamese readership and the, that the world readership will love my books bit by bit, yeah. I have a few more questions, but I also want to make sure that we get you involved in terms of asking your questions, and then maybe we'll come back to some of mine. Are there people who would like to participate in the conversation and ask questions to Isabel Mueller? Mm -hmm. 
from birth. And the second thing is you have beautiful. And so you, my question is that you had challenged yourself in writing in German. How about another challenge to write another book in Vietnamese? Oh, unfortunately, my Vietnamese is not as good. This is why I am a little bit too shy until now to, uh, to dare to speak Vietnamese. I understand, you know, it's, it's something that is wonderful, uh, that shows us how great the, the human body is built. My mother used to speak Vietnamese with me uh, until I was about three years old. And then she stopped. Uh, you, you know why she had to stop? Uh, because the director of the school came to our house and uh, asked her to stop uh, speaking Vietnamese because uh, he explained to her that it was not healthy for the, for the children, that they would mix uh, all the things in their brain and uh, she should um, only speak French with them. So this is the reason why she quit. Uh, and in fact, 50 years later, since I came back to Vietnam, uh, I, I try to come as often as possible to Vietnam. Uh, so a minimum of three times a year, but sometimes I, I can come four or five times, even six times a year. And uh, the more I am here in Vietnam and the more, more familiar I, I feel when I hear the Vietnamese language. So I, I hear some uh, words that are really uh, strange, you know, like familiar things, and they, they look familiar uh, to me. I recognize them. So I, bit by bit, my memory starts working, and this is why it looks like a language that is somewhere here. And uh, I am still learning Vietnamese language uh, by my own with an app, because I do not live in a big city uh, in, in Germany. Uh, if I would live in a big city with a Vietnamese community, it would be very easy for me to find a teacher. Uh, I also don't want to learn online because of my time. Um, I would prefer to have a private teacher, you know, that comes to my house. So maybe in six months or one year, I would be able to, to speak fluently. So I decided to learn it bit by bit by my own with an app. I do it since uh, three years now. And so bit by bit, I have a, a small vocabulary. I can understand uh, many things, but I don't dare to speak yet. And I have no ambition to be able to write uh, into Vietnamese because uh, uh, being a writer um, requests a lot of abilities. You have to be able to express all the levels of your emotions. And I think in Vietnamese, in this life, I will not be able to do it. <laughs> Maybe in the next one. <laughs> Okay, you go ahead. Yeah. Hmm. Th thank you so much Isabel, for uh, sharing this this really really one you know wonderful two books uh, of of your family's story. One thing that struck me a lot, uh, exactly you know, reflecting on what you said, you're not just writing it about yourself as an individual, but about the community and about the the the. Uh, experiences of people like you, right? Um, one one thing I notice is, you know, your childhood and your upbringing. You don't actually get that many other Vietnamese uh, Vietnamese heritage people uh, around you, um, uh, which is a different experience, I think, from some of the other diasporic writers. Let's say in California or in Texas, and so, and in France as well, right? And and as you say, in Germany as well, where they have those communities, right? And yet. What I also see is uh, your mother being. A, I, I wonder if she's very special in this way. But, but you know, like you see these scenes of real poverty on in the French countryside. You see um, scenes of uh, you know her uh, raising chickens. Right. You have these pictures of her just raising chickens, exactly like we see in the streets of Saigon. You know, and places like in in these long right in the in the in the basket uh, type, very like com exactly like a scene from the Vietnamese countryside, like in in France. And then you have these uh, homes by the railroad, right? Also something we like to do. <laughs> yeah, I think that the poor people like to live like right by the railroad, 
right, uh, for opportunities for like market trading and things like that, right? And then also the stories of her, what like, take like seeing some potentially some uh, birds uh, trying to steal her her corn, and then like just start taking a gun out and start shooting everywhere, and then like bringing out her big knife, like the Vietnamese big knife, to for like to 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 like uh, threaten those those guys that say uh, racist things, right? So I mean that that that's very the cleaver, yeah, like the, like the chicken bone cleaver, I, I assume. And you grow up also like killing these animals, well, uh, uh, like um, the ducks. The, yeah, the ducks and chickens and and so on, right? This is a very Vietnamese upbringing in the middle of you know, not many Vietnamese people, right? So do you think your mother is special in this way and your family special? Or do you think that this happens a lot in France and Germany and in these places, but like no one just really talks about it, right? Um, and it's not like recorded, it's not like seen, it's not pictured anywhere? Yeah. Well, uh, I have, uh, I only have a few pictures uh of uh, these times when I was a small child, when my mom uh, lived in France in poverty, when she raised uh, the, the chickens and the ducks and all this stuff. But I think my mom was pretty special. I think that uh, she, she wanted to, to explain to us the Vietnamese culture. Yeah, I think the, she had never forgotten her roots and this was the main thing. And when she, when I grew up in France, she played uh, some Vietnamese music. She translated the songs. She always said that the Vietnamese uh, songs were about departing and someone was waiting. <laughs> I think till now nothing has changed. <laughs> um, she, of course, she cooked very well uh, Vietnamese food. So all the five five children of us, uh, we can cook pretty well all the Vietnamese dishes. Um, but I described uh, all these scenes, especially in her book, uh, because I think that the your generation and the um, your your parents' generation sometimes might have a wrong idea about the ideal that they have from living abroad. You know, like even the, the German. When when I speak with German people and when they say uh, when they know that I am from France, they say, "Oh, the great red wine and the good cheese and the fresh bread." You know, it's uh, typical. And, you know, being a tourist in a foreign country is something, it's one part. But living in the country is a different part. And my mom had to live there. And uh, she had to live there under very, very difficult uh, situation. Uh, we were very poor and my mom was tough. And because she was a tough Vietnamese woman, she could survive. I mean, she when before I was born, she used to live on the countryside, um, where there was no heating uh, in the in the house. She but she knew how to make fire. You know, uh, uh, my mom, her 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 dad was a hunter. We are coming from a hunter family, so she knew how to hunt. She knew how to make fire. She knew how which water she could drink, and she even knew to catch fish in the river by hand. I mean, even me, I don't know how to do it, but she did it. Because one brother of mine, that I have a five, a four siblings, and my elder brother told me that he remembers to my mom catching the, the fish in the river to be able to cook something for them. And uh, this is why I think because of her Vietnamese roots, it was a big help for us and for her to, to survive and to feed the family and the siblings. And uh, I think she was very proud of it. And um, she explained to us children uh, different things. And it was up to us children to, to want to understand or not. You know, even the five of us are very different children. So, but I think it is, uh, it is uh, very important uh, to talk about the roots and... Uh, I, I am very thankful uh, to have Vietnamese blood because of that, because it shows me that the Vietnamese uh, uh, origin is a very strong one. Yeah, 
Yeah, so maybe I can follow up on, on that a little bit. So you speak a lot about these um, you know, really harrowing, uh, interesting uh, experiences that are special. Uh, I think maybe it, some things that are maybe left out of the book is how, you know, living this sort of existence, you're able to then sort of become the writer that, that you are later on, right? Because, you know, how, how was your education like? I guess we didn't have a very clear picture of that, right? Living by the railroad and raising chickens, uh, you know. Uh, of course, that's an education in itself, right? Um, but, but, you know, because you also talk about your interactions with the um, uh, Romani community uh, as well. Uh, the like the um, traveler communities in in uh, I think in in French you call them Romani right um, uh, oh Zigan Zigan yeah in in French yeah yeah Zigan yeah and I think in Vietnamese also Zigan right and and they they have a, a sort of maybe similar uh, um, uh, life but but they're you know may, maybe the the, the the pathways were also divergent at certain points. Right? So, what, what was your education like? And you know, do you think you know what? How did you think that you sort of became the writer that you are? Uh, what happened to your siblings, and did they take different paths or uh, similar to you? Yeah. Well, my education. Yeah, you're right when you say that the school of life was also education. Yeah, that for sure. And yeah, we had something in common with the uh, with the Gipsies. Um, that were living uh, also in the surroundings uh, because they were also not accepted by the French community because they were uh, wild. And so it was something we had in common. Uh, in fact, uh, the going to school for me was a kind of a safe place uh, because as we, you will uh, have read in my book, uh, at home, uh, uh, unfortunately my home was not a safe place where I had to grow up. Uh, but the school was something very special, and my mother had always underlined that um, education is a big privilege. And at this, this time, at the beginning, I didn't understand what she was saying, because uh, everybody, all the children were going to school, so I couldn't make the difference. But bit by bit, I understood that the more knowledge you have and the more uh, powerful you are. And I could see that being good at school um, would, uh, would give me more freedom uh, towards the teachers because they had respect, you know, being a good pupil, you know, they, they had nothing to, uh, to, uh, to talk about or to criticize because I was a very good student. And uh, in fact, school was easy for me. In fact, it was boring, <laughs> very boring because uh, I wanted to know more. <laughs> Yeah, at that time, you didn't have the opportunity. You know, I grew up, I went to school in a, uh, in a small village. And at that time, you had no opportunity to, to uh, skip some classes. Uh, I think at that time, I would have been able to skip two classes because the level was uh, too low for me. But anyway, so it means that when I came back home, I, I almost never did my homework because I had already everything in my head. So I had to work in the restaurant. So it was a good thing to be clever. Um, and um, concerning my, uh, yeah, my Vita, I, ha I had to fight uh, because when I finished um, the, the secondary school, uh, it was, um, uh, it was um, uh, how do you say, obligatory to go to a certain uh, college and um, uh, to go to a high school. And I refused because I wanted to learn languages. I, I had, uh, as I said, I always followed my intuition. And I, I had heard one day uh, a broadcast uh, on French TV and the journalist was speaking Russian. I heard only one sentence and I knew this language. Uh, I want to learn it because it seemed familiar. I don't know how. And uh, there was only one, uh, one high school in Tours that offered uh, to, to learn this language and they refused me two times. <laughs> and uh, I was stubborn, and the third time I tried again, <laughs> and then they accepted me. And, uh, and after that, I applied um, uh, to, to receive a big scholarship in order to be able to, to study. But I didn't have the opportunity to, to study a long time, only two years at the French University 
in combination with a school for interpreters and translators. So it was sometimes uh, pretty tough because I had to, to learn like uh, maximum 18 hours. Sometimes it happened that the days were very long and when I came back home, I had to work in the restaurant to help my mom to earn money. So it was a pretty tough time, but I survived. And uh, with the 20, I was finished. And then I tried to find some uh, job in uh, France. But, uh, uh, well, I fulfilled all the requests, I would say, with my knowledge. But they didn't fulfill my request of behavior. <laughs> and so I refused. And when I understood, you know, in, in France, uh, you have a different system. If you have the money, you have the connections. So I had no money, so I had no connections. If you have no money and no connections, you have your body. So this is the, the payment. So if you want to find a job, most of the time you can get a job, but you have to sleep with a director or you have to sleep with a, someone. So jobs like this, I would, I, I got offers every day, you know. <laughs> Even one told me, yeah, you can come, you got the job tomorrow, but you have to bring your, your sleep, you know, new sleep every day. Uh, so I said, no, sorry. Then I went to Paris to find a job. And then the same, the same offer. Wow, you're talented. You speak many languages. You're great. You got the contract, but uh, sometimes you will need to be nice to our boss. And I said, no. And then the, the guy said, you know, you're saying no, but behind this door, you have nine other girls that will say yes. And this is the moment when I understood, okay, as long as others will say yes, I will never be uh, able to find a job. And from that point, I quit. I prepared my suitcases and I went to Germany. And then I found a job pretty quickly. Double paid. <laughs> yeah, and I got a good job. And in the meanwhile, I learned my future husband. And uh, for him, I quit my job. I had a great job. Mm -hmm. And then he asked me to follow him to Russia. And uh, because I was curious, I said, OK, well, why not? It's adventure. Uh, I'm not afraid to try new things and I left I quit my job and I, I left uh, Germany to live in Kazakhstan for one year it was a, an adventurous uh, life but I I do not regret one single thing yeah I would even not change a single world no it's my life Hi, um, I think that I can draw a resemblance of your book to one of the books that we learned in a core humanity course, which is Tibu is the best we could do. So both books talk about uh, trying to find, rediscover what Vietnam really is to uh, a generation of immigrants, while Tibu is, who lives in America, she seems to be uh, I, I guess she's still trying to rediscover her her origin, and she also draws a lot of uh, influence from her her family. Um, I think that uh, you also say a lot about your mother, who I think is a major reason why you came back to Vietnam. So I just want to ask, um, oh, how much does your family or is your mother uh, influence you to? make a decision to reconnect, to try to yeah, reconnect with Vietnam, trying to find what Vietnam really means in heart? Well, I think my mother, uh, she, she doesn't know, uh, well, she is now here uh, above us, um, but at that time she never asked me to come back to Vietnam. She just showed me, uh, you know, the few features of this country and it was up to me to discover the features by myself. It was my own choice. Uh, and I think, you know, it, I do not reject my French origin um, because even uh, with my father, he is still my father. And uh, because of him, I am here. And so in a way, I am thankful. And I understood also with time that uh, he was not able 
to give more than he, what he gave. So because some people, you know, sometimes you ask uh, yourself many questions, why did people do things like that? And uh, when you understand that they are not able to do more than that or to be a better person, it's up to them. You have to accept that. But going back to the roots and discovering uh, that uh, I am seeking uh, to come back to Vietnam was uh, coming with the years when I noticed every time I was coming back to Vietnam that I felt much better. I, I you know, it's a kind of a feeling that you get. When you are somewhere, you feel comfortable or you don't. And here in Vietnam, I feel very comfortable with all. And this is why uh, I always compare myself with a fish swimming in the water. <laughs> yeah, so, but uh, I travel a lot and I, I love, though, discovering the world. So for me to also to develop my mind and uh, I absorb the different things in the different cultures, not only the Vietnamese one. And this is why I, I want to put all my feelings and my, my thoughts in the books I write. And uh, of course, my mom had a big influence um, on me because she gave me a lot of love. This is one, one big thing. But uh, I think the whole, the whole environment around me gave me uh, uh, many things as far as I'm using my brain, <laughs> you know. I want to latch on to that in terms of positive influences from other women, women uh, role models. You mentioned a few in your book, including your older sister to a certain extent and, and the... Priscilla, and so if you can talk about people who have influenced you, especially women, and who have shaped you to become who you are today, that would be really great for us to hear. Uh, well, especially when I was living in Germany, um, I was 10, and uh, I didn't feel very comfortable at the beginning because I couldn't speak the language, I had no friends, and I was the last one at, at class. <laughs> so it was, at the beginning, not a very nice time. But uh, then I suddenly met uh, a woman, a foreign woman, uh, and uh, I call her my second mother. She was a, such a um, kind woman, very powerful. <laughs> and uh, she took care suddenly of, of me and my, my siblings. Uh, I lived at that time with my sister and one brother in Germany. And uh, she took so good care of us, like uh, her own children. And uh, there was a point when I saw all the good things she was doing for me that I um, thought, one day, should I be as powerful as she is and should I be as rich as she is, I promise that I will do the same for others. Because um, uh, it impressed me a lot and uh, I think she did it just like this. She was a good person, and uh, it was something very touching, and she impressed me very much in my life. So there were a few people yeah, that uh, impressed me, not only women, also men. My husband would be such a, a person, too. And so how do you channel that in terms of creating the foundation that you created and being a role model yourself? Uh, well... Uh, bit by bit, I could uh, make career and earn uh, a little bit more money in my life. Uh, we have built up uh, a company, my husband and me. And so um, at the beginning, I just wanted to build one school for the poorest children of ethnic minorities in, uh, in the northern areas. And uh, after I had realized uh, the first project, I noticed that uh, I was able to continue because there was no reason for me to stop. Uh, I think um, I am able to continue this work and it's, uh, it seems easy to me, you know, my, o my only job is to find uh, donors and people that support uh, bit by bit. And I, get, I collect the, the funds and uh, with these funds I, I build uh, schools or boarding houses and equip them or I check each project by my own I travel, for example, to different provinces in the northern areas, and uh, I see by my own what the children really need. 
and uh, I realize these projects and check them. So I am sure that uh, everything, the money is uh, arriving and uh, that uh, there are no fees or, you know, people taking money for themselves. All the money is going in, uh, into the building and into the things that stay there and that are used by the children directly. So they have a better education. And so it, it's fun because uh, I love it because uh, some children, I am sure, will never forget that. And uh, maybe one day uh, one of these children will be able to, to study and uh, get later a great job and, and uh, do something also, you know, uh, would be able to continue the, the cycle of love and of sharing. Yeah, this is what I hope. Yeah, very much goes in line with what you were saying earlier about education being a source for social mobility and a source of freedom. Um, yeah. Good afternoon. Uh, so I I have a, I have one question going back to the craft of writing. Um, you, I really like the point you made about us living on Earth and we have freedom uh, of life and freedom in thoughts, um, you know, deep down and into life. Um, and so, and you've had a lot of experience um, since you were a young child and also continuing till this day. And so I was thinking if when you were, and, and then also you listen to your mother's stories and then you put everything back into a book, um, and then your own stories into another book. And I was wondering if you had any methods um, to, you know, to, to structure all the stories and all your experiences. Um, did you follow your, the events chrono chronologically or did you have any you know, methodology that you used to be able to write the books? Uh, yeah, I forgot to answer the, the former question. It was uh, how I got to, to be a writer. Uh, yeah, when I was at school, uh, I noticed that uh, all the essays that I wrote for, for the teacher were always chosen by the teacher. So it was something that motivated me a lot because I noticed that I, I was able to write and that people really reacted on my writing. So this is uh, at that moment uh, that I... I decided to become a writer. And yes, I have a chronology uh, when I write. You know, writing a biography is very easy to me uh, because a biography, you cannot change anything. <laughs> you have the start and you have the life with the different um, uh, times of, what, of the, what happened. And then you have to follow this chronology. Writing a novel is pretty different. But uh, also with a novel, uh, I also follow uh, chronology. I have a plan. Uh, in fact, maybe I am special. I, the most um, difficult work is to start and to end. And all the things that are in the middle, I let, I let the inspiration you know, uh, express itself. I think uh, I am a very different person when I write. Uh, I would say I am not myself. <laughs> it is very strange because sometimes when I read what I have written, uh, I say, wow, <laughs> is it me? Is it me <laughs> that wrote that? But I think this is a, a, a process of maybe meditation. I am in another world and I let this world uh, speak to me and it is guiding me because it knows exactly uh, where to put the emotions and where to put all the feelings and the messages inside. It is an art. Yeah, I think, I think it is a, a wonderful profession. But I haven't, I haven't had uh, any teacher uh, who taught me how to write. I only had one uh, French teacher when I was at high school. She had written one uh, long poem that I wrote. And then she explained to me that, uh, because I had one mistake in this poem, and then she said, but, but, you are the artist, you are the writer, and you have the freedom. 
the freedom of mind, it means you are allowed to make mistakes because you are the author. And it was something that really impressed me a lot because she was a very good teacher to me. And uh, then I understood that I am free. When I write, I am free. I can say, I can share all the things I have inside myself. Yeah, And uh, this is why I love writing. But what about the really difficult experiences? How do you approach writing about these experiences? Because sometimes it means revisiting the trauma or revisiting those experiences that are difficult. How do you put them into language? Well, concerning my own life, as I said, uh, it was not difficult to me. I just wrote it down because it was an experience. To me, it was not, not anything special. Uh, so it was not difficult. What was difficult was writing down the story of my mom. I cried very much. Ah, minimum 50 times. <laughs> yeah, because I had to, to put myself in her and to, uh, to live it again. Her emotions and her feelings and all of it. And it was really touching and uh, really devastating sometimes uh, when I had to write down all the suffering that she had to endure. Yeah, her book, writing her book made me cry a lot, suffer a lot. Yeah. But uh, mine, no, no. I, I made a cross. It's over. <laughs> Um, I'm, I'm very curious about your statement earlier um, about uh, not limiting yourself with one identity, but also be proud of the identity that you have. Um, so I want to ask, um, what does it mean to you to have, uh, say, different identities in a very, uh, in a fixed or a systemized uh, culture? culture environment, for example, like being a ver being in a, an environment where there's sexisms, racisms, uh, what does it mean to you to have, you know, different identities that you put on yourself, like being a woman, being a mixed child, or uh, now being a writer, you know, yeah. Oh, uh, I'm not sure that I understand the question uh, quite correctly, but uh, I think the, um, as long as you live in peace and as long as you leave the others live in peace, <laughs> it is pretty easy to, to identify yourself with your identity. It doesn't matter who you are, uh, what you are, what you decide to be. Uh, the main thing is to, to live in balance. You know, uh, As long as you find your own balance, you can, you can live everywhere and it doesn't matter what, what others uh, think about you and others say about you. And uh, of course, every, each of us is seeking for love. You know, each of us is doing something or learning something in order to get recognized as a smart hum human being that is worth to be loved. It is all the, ma the main, the main uh, seeking that we have, the main intention. And uh, I think um, um, just being a living, a living human being uh, that is uh, caring about the social people around is the most important thing. Yeah, to be taking care of each other and to be respecting and also to be open-minded. Yeah, because all these little things will, uh, will um, uh, complete your own identity. I think I was also very curious about that because when you have the freedom to exert your identity and affirm those things, and yet everything around you tells you that you can't be those things or tries to invalidate those very characteristics that make you who you are, how do you respond to that? How do you cope with that? Well, there is one thing I want to tell you, especially when people tell you that you are not able to do anything. <laughs> Don't believe them. <laughs> you know, uh, I have been told 
when I was a young child um, by some people that I was nothing worth, that I would never make it. Uh, when I was in Germany and I told a few people that I wanted to be a famous writer, they laughed like, who? <laughs> You're French? You want to write a book in German and you want to be famous? <laughs> so they smiled. But one thing, I always kept my vision. I still, I still have my vision because I believe in what I am. I believe in my future and I believe in my abilities. I trust myself. I don't care what people say. I am happy, of course, if the people love me and if they believe in me and if they motivate me and say, yeah, we know that you are capable to do it. Um, but I've learned not to believe the ones that do not believe in me. Even with the publishers, you know, in Germany, uh, it is really difficult in Germany to find a famous uh, publisher's house, especially as a mixed uh, author. <laughs> But I succeeded, but I still have at home all the letters, it's a big step like that, of all the publisher's house that refused me. <laughs> they didn't even read what I sent to them, you know, they just let, lay it on the desk and then it stays there because I could speak with the secretaries that explain me how the system is working, yeah? So they get lots of letters, you know, appliance, like 200s every day. It stays on the desk for two months, and then they move it from this part of the desk to the other part of the desk. They don't read. And then the secretary is typing the letter. You know, we are so sorry. We know you are talented, but unfortunately, we cannot, uh, you know, accept you. And letters like this, I have a lot. <laughs> and it makes me smile. <laughs> because uh, I know that I am capable and uh, I, I succeeded. Because I believed in my dream. Yeah, I never gave up my dream. So if you feel inside that you have a, you know, a goal, something that is waiting for you, you never lose it out of sight. You never, you never forget that. You know, my life has been really curvy a lot. I have, uh, I have had to do different jobs and to wait a long time until I could uh, be a writer like I wanted to be. Uh, I had to do many other things uh, that were, that were, connected with the hard work and uh, suffering and enduring, but uh, I still had the hope that one day it would hit. And uh, I am so happy and thankful that I can achieve and do the things I, I want. Yeah, so this is why. Do not believe the ones that do not believe in you, because you are yourself and you know the best who you are. So, so continuing on from that, um, did, you didn't seem to have any help really from um, the sort of diasporic Vietnamese community in, in these connections, as I understand it. Um, you know, because we have a program here where uh, Ian in particular and, and others uh, study, you know, the Vietnamese diasporic communities and, and literature. Um, and we've also had a few... Uh, uh, um, authors uh, come to us, for, like Nguyen Phan Quy Mai, you know, she's in uh, the United States and she wrote uh, some some great books recently. I wonder if you've, um, you know, with your recent successes, if you've um, drawn any inspiration from other diasporic writers, if you have any connections with, with the community there, um, and whether you have any plans to maybe share your experience and support uh, others and, and to find support in that network in Germany and France and, and elsewhere. Yeah. Well, I, I do not have any contact to any diasporas. Uh, of course, I am always uh, um, ready to, to share my experiences and my thoughts. If people want to, to listen to them, or if they want to, you know, to know about my, uh, my own way, but uh, no, I don't have uh, any contact to them uh, anywhere in the world. I know a few names. I also have read a few books about some Vietnamese authors, uh, mainly about uh, their Vietnamese roots and uh, the ambivalence of being, uh, you know, Vietnamese living abroad and stuff like that. But um, no, I, I do not have uh, any contact. But of course, 
I stay at, <laughs> at your disposal. <laughs> if somebody wants to share some, some thoughts or invite me to share my thoughts, uh, it would be my pleasure. Hello. So um, your book uh, for me is uh, very heavy to read. Yeah. And um, uh, <laughs> like the thing I find really interesting is that you say you didn't write, write when you write your uh, biography. So um, like when I uh, read through your book, um, the like the part that um, like intriguing for me is that uh, you were abused by uh, like your family, your, your father. And so I wonder, like, how did you overcome that? And like, how did, like, why it take that long for you to stand up and to uh, speak for yourself? Like, I know that you, like, have to been a poor, uh, worse abused for such a long time. Well, it is something that uh, I've been talking about uh, many years when I was uh, going on lectures uh, in Germany. Um, it is a, a behavior that uh, victims of sexual abuse uh, usually go through. Uh, it is a trauma. It is a trauma that needs time. Uh, sometimes people cannot overcome. Some victims um, need their whole life to overcome it. So. Uh, it might take uh, 30, 40, 50 years to be able to speak about that because uh, these are um, lots of uh, psychological traumatism and uh, it is um, mainly very difficult to be able to, to talk about that. Uh, usually you can start talking about that with a therapist or when... Uh, when you understand that it is able to speak about that because uh, you are uh, stigmatized and um, uh, it was a shame when something like this happened to you. And uh, when you are a victim yourself, you think that the world is seeing that, but in fact, they do not notice anything. You know, you, you have your own, you develop your own world and you think that the people will never understand you and so you you hide your emotions and uh, you are uh, changing your behavior and uh, uh, I think I could overcome it bit by bit. It took me some years, you know, uh, and there were a few times in my life where I almost didn't make it. Uh, when I was uh, 13 and when, when I was 17, I wanted to commit suicide because I didn't have any clue how to get out of it. Uh, I didn't want to continue uh, living because life was not worth it for me. And uh, then when <laughs> I think the sky didn't want me to, to die, I felt that maybe there was something else that was planned for, my, for me. And then I talked. I talked to the sky and I said, okay, if you don't allow me to die, if you have a plan for me, <laughs> then show me your plan pretty quickly. <laughs> and, and this is the moment uh, when I found the strength, the physical strength to uh, resist uh, and to defend myself for the very first time. Uh, because when I was younger, I was uh, pretty shy. I was a pretty sensible child, you know. Uh, I was a good kid, but I was a girl, and I was always obeying, and I was uh, um, yeah, a girl, a girl like that. And then I, I started to defend myself and uh, to be more self-determined and uh, to to find the strengths inside. And uh, I think that knowing that um, being abused is not a shame for yourself, but is a shame of the villain that does it, is a, makes the difference. And uh, this is why I really encourage the victims. Um, it can be boys and girls, not only girls, you know, it is, 
I've been working with some with many associations in Germany talking about that because even in Germany it was a taboo subject and uh, the therapist didn't understand quite like how a victim feels like uh, you know the the procedure of all your thoughts they could not get it and uh, how to develop a resilience and how to understand the small signs that the victims are showing I think uh, I helped them three and a half years long to to detect the small signs that uh, children or uh, victims would would show for example uh, with the uh, drawings I think expressing things in writing depending of you know if a child is writing a story with a something that is strange then you should ask as a parent or as a teacher or if a child is drawing something really curious then you should also ask because it is the way of expressing the suffering inside many many things like this um, and uh, I think when you when you are able to overcome this trauma then you are very strong and you are able to help the other victims to speak out because speaking out is the most powerful weapon that we have because first you are not uh, responsible for that and second you will understand that you are not the only one you know because you think that you are an exception but you are not the exception this is happening all over the world all over the world in each family and in each class in the poor class or in the rich class it happens everywhere and the more the victims speak out the less this will happen so this is why I encourage each of the victims to talk about that not to be afraid did you encounter any editorial obstacles when you were articulating some of those narratives into the story I, I feel like I've read that there was some censorship involved or um, some of the details had to be cut out uh, yeah in fact the the very original German version was tougher <laughs> Uh, so the publisher was afraid of uh, of that yeah so they had cut many passages that were too detailed because uh, you would never have been able to read it <laughs> for me it was normal but for them it was shocking and so we agreed on a middle way so <laughs> I think it really speaks to yes the courage it takes to speak but also the courage it takes to listen and to receive that kind of information well the it's not only my courage I think the the biggest courage is uh, the one of the publisher mm. I think this is the publisher that deserves a lot of uh, awards mm -hmm. for doing that yeah because it is not uh, self-understood it is a, you know it is something special with uh, some sensitive subjects and and uh, you don't find many publishers that are brave enough to say okay we know about the problem but usually we don't speak about that and to find one publisher that is ready to say okay I publish it and then we will see <laughs> uh, I really admire my publisher for doing that yeah I think it's quite impressive too because at least for me and my exposure to the American uh, popular culture and literature that's published there sexual abuse is something that's that's becoming more prevalent and being more talked about but in Vietnam and perhaps in Western Europe not well now a bit by bit you know uh, I, I published this book in Germany in 2009 and in 2010 there was a big wave coming up like oh my god there is one woman speaking you know about that how can she dare and who is she and uh, we, we need to meet her and and so it started up and and now it is not a taboo anymore so everybody is ready to talk about that and now they created a few organizations with therapists and with help so that the victims can go uh, can go to and can get some advice and get can get some help psychological help or financial help or you know the human help so they are not left alone uh, and that's the most important thing if I would have had such a place to go when I was a child, 
in France, I would have gone to. I would have, you know, if I would have a coin to dial the number of someone that would listen to me and would help me, I would have done that at that time. But at that time, there was nothing. Everybody, you know, it, it was happening everywhere, but people just didn't talk about that. They would even spank you and punish you if you would dare to say something like that. You would be a bad child. Yeah, so time have changed, and it is good that they changed to improve and protect the child, the children. Yeah. Right, this was also before the wave of Me Too in the U.S., okay. and just speaking up about sexual abuse or sexual harassment, mm -hmm. and recognizing the complicity in the society in terms of not speaking yeah. about this. Well, but you have to be careful when you, you, you put the Me Too, uh, the Me Too uh, movement uh, with a, a subject of sexual abuse. You know, mm -hmm. sexual harassment, okay, it happens. Mm -hmm. But there I want to, to underline that uh, you have this point of view and they have the other ones. Because uh, I know that some, uh, some people accepted, obviously, mm -hmm. to, to do it in order to make career. Mm -hmm. And it is easy to come later and to complain. Mm -hmm. So not all of them are really victims. This is something I want to say. Of course, it is not good when somebody is uh, abusing um, and using the power in order to get some advantages. This is not good. But uh, you have to make the difference between the real victims and the ones that want to be a victim in order to get some attention. Mm -hmm. mm. Yeah, that's a really, I mean, the Me Too movement was very controversial. And it's a very important clarification. Um, with just a remaining time, I wanted to ask you to comment on the title of the book and this imagery of the phoenix. Because in order for the phoenix to be as beautiful as it is, there's a death required. Yeah, so you talked a little bit about that in your own experience. But um, if you can just comment further in terms of your mother and for you and this legacy of the phoenix that is invoked here. Yeah, well, uh, the phoenix was the name uh, of the small girl, the little girl that my mother gave birth to when she was uh, young. Uh, and this baby died uh, pretty early. And uh, my, my mom had uh, named her Luan uh, because uh, she was the symbol for her. At that time, she got the baby without uh, being married. And it was a shame at that time because virginity was the only good that a woman had. And so she did not marry and raised up the child alone. And uh, it meant that she was like a prostitute, but it didn't, it didn't matter to her. She loved her child and, and fortunately this little girl died. And in order never to forget that she will always overcome uh, the struggle in her life, she named herself Luan. So, in fact, my, mom, my mom's name is Dauti Cook, but she named herself Luan. And for us children, she was always uh, Mae Luan. So, the mother Phoenix, and uh, yeah, I'm, I am her daughter, so I am Phoenix daughter. <laughs> and of course, uh, it is important for the Phoenix to die uh, in order to be reborn again. Yeah, and a Phoenix should not be afraid of death. Yeah. So what, uh, you said you might be writing some more things, and what can we expect from you as a writer now? What are some new projects that you might be working on? Uh, you, mean, you mean the literary projects? Yes. Or the, yeah? yes. Oh, uh, I have a few. I have a few. Well, you have here, I see the children's book, uh, Hip Hop mm -hmm. in the Land of Elzebe. Uh, this is part one. And uh, I already de delivered the part two to my publisher. So the part two will be published next year. Uh, it will be a serial and uh, hip hop. The little flea is uh, saving the the world and uh, taking care taking care of the worries of the children, you know, and solving all the problems. So it is, uh, I think, uh, a nice thing to to uh, make life more enjoyable for children and to understand the world better, to respect nature and to respect each other and to respect also the, dif the diversity. You know, not everybody uh, looks nice, but 
even the people that do not look nice have some good features and so you have to discover them and this is what I am trying to explain to the children with my children's book and uh, as a next uh, book project for adults um, I finished uh, during the corona the COVID time uh, I wrote a novel with uh, 350 pages and it it is uh, translated into Vietnamese language and uh, beginning of next year I will propose it to the to some Vietnamese publisher and we will see may I hope that next year it will be published in Vietnam uh, it is a fantastic novel um, it is a contemporary love, love story um, it is a satiric uh, story uh, with a deep uh, subjects like uh, is there a God? Are we God ourselves? Do, do we have uh, the chance to change something, you know, if we change our focus? And uh, should we change our focus on things in order to be more happy? Stuff like that. So pretty serious subjects that I have uh, written in a, I think, in a very uh, easy way to read, but it is a very deep subject that uh, also is very important to me uh, because sometimes you judge a situation and in fact if you would change your focus you would change your mind mm. and this is how I encourage the people to always try to to think like the others would do in order to better understand why they act like this very mindful approach. Thank you so much, Isabel Mueller. This was such a pleasure. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> uh, if you don't mind, yeah. Uh,